Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome all of you today to our webinar on integrating home visiting data with early childhood data systems, an overview of resources. My name is Carlise King and I'm the Executive Director for the Early Childhood Data Collaborative at Child Trends and I will be helping to facilitate the webinar today. Before we begin, I just have a few housekeeping items to review. Uh, a recording of this webinar and a copy of the PowerPoint slides from the presentation will be made available um, on the Early Childhood Data Collaborative's website, but also will be sent out to all people who registered. Uh, due to the large number of people we have participating on the call today, we have all of the attendees muted, but we encourage you and you can, can submit questions throughout the webinar using the question box that's located on your panel. And we will respond to you in between presenters, but also we've set aside a good amount of time at the end of the call to have discussion. So before um, we start, I just want to start with a quick overview of the Early Childhood Data Collaborative and a little bit about the present, the purpose of our webinar today. The Early Childhood Data Collaborative was established in 2009 with the mission to support state policy makers in not only promoting policies and practices that support the coordination and use of coordinated longitudinal early childhood data systems. The reason for that is understanding that the evolution of early of funding for early care and education programs has resulted in a configuration of programs that differ from state to state. Uh, the Early Childhood Data Collaborative, or ECDC, has created a framework for developing a coordinated longitudinal data system with the goal of helping states transform their data systems that have typically been used to comply with funding and reporting to more improvement-driven data systems, which can provide feedback that really can be used to guide decision-making and policies. However, what we've found is that most states' data systems are fragmented um, and are not able to connect data about young children because these data are housed in multiple systems. They're typically uncoordinated and they're managed by different state and federal agencies. What this means is that data that could help policymakers answer critical questions about program access, about workforce development needs, or school readiness are not accessible. It also means that what we're getting is usually what's usually available to policymakers and decision makers are snapshots of children at any, any given time. And that doesn't really help policymakers understand how a child might benefit from participation in different programs over time and whether quality programs or our workforce are improving based on our early childhood investments. So to increase the access and, and usability of early childhood data, what we've seen is states are really starting to develop processes to be able to coordinate or integrate data about children's services. And we've been looking to understand what, where that's happening and what those state examples are so that we can share those nationally. Next slide. In 2018, the Early Childhood Data Collaborative surveyed all 50 states to assess their capacity to connect data about children enrolled in early childhood programs. Um, and also whether states were able to connect whether children were participating in other health or social services, and also to understand if they could answer questions longitudinally around children as they travel through the education system. This graphic shows programs and the programs that we define in early childhood in our framework. Beginning from the right-hand side with the orange bar, looking at home visiting, then Head Start, um, early intervention services for birth to three, as well as preschool education, three to five, and then state preschool and subsidized childcare that focuses on children early childhood services for children three to five in preschool and up to age 13 for subsidized care. When we surveyed states to find out about their capacity to gather information around children served within and across these programs, we found that less than half or 22 states linked early childhood data from some or all of these programs. 
But what was surprising is that we found that home visiting as well as Head Start were the least likely to be connected as states were building state data systems to understand and answer question about early childhood services. The exclusion, this exclusion represents a significant knowledge gap because particularly in home visiting, because of the program's focus on comprehensive services for families is information we feel is really critical um, for policymakers to have access to as they make decisions regarding early care and education policies. Based on these findings, we wanted to understand why states were not including home visiting in their efforts to integrate early childhood data, what the key barriers were, and then ultimately what strategies and approaches could help make changes that were needed to happen to include home visiting in state level efforts to integrate data about early childhood programs. So that is the purpose of our webinar today, and I'm happy to now hand the presentation over to my colleague, Dr. Dale Epstein, who has been leading this effort at Child Trends, and is going to share more about our work to increase the number of states that are integrating home visiting data with other early childhood data, and what are some key strategies and resources we've developed. Dale? Thanks, Carly. So we're excited to talk to you today about the state level home visiting integration with early childhood data systems or SHINE on the next slide. The project um, and the resources that we've developed to support your work in this area. Next slide, please. So first today, we're gonna provide a high level overview of the goals and objectives of the project. And then we will briefly describe each of the resources we've developed to support states in integrating their home visiting data with other early childhood data. As Carly mentioned, home visiting programs are some of the least likely programs to be linked or integrated with other early childhood data. So these resources were developed to support that work. We'll also highlight some of the data integration work that our state partners have done. And we'll save time at the end to take your questions and also our state partners that participated in SHINE are on the line to answer your questions as well. On the next slide, to give you an overview of the project, the goal of the SHINE project is to support states that are interested in linking their home visiting data with other early childhood data. We know that not only is home visiting data rarely linked to other early childhood data, but it's also rarely linked between different home visiting models or home visiting programs, and sometimes even within the same home visiting model, the data aren't linked. So for this work, the SHINE team provided technical and um, assistance to five states that were interested in this work, and some had already begun integrating their early childhood data. And then, as I mentioned, we also developed a suite of resources for all states to use that are interested in this work um, and are working on similar home visiting data integration efforts, and wanted to acknowledge this project is supported by the Heisen Simon Foundation. The next slide. As I mentioned, five states were selected to participate. So those states are Minnesota, North Carolina, Oklahoma, Rhode Island, and Utah. And the SHINE team worked with each of these states, providing both technical and financial assistance to support them in developing their plans and goals around integrating home visiting data with other early childhood data. These states also participated in peer-to-peer -peer learning sessions over the course of the project to learn from one another about the work that they were engaged in. We also developed a toolkit of resources that we'll show you in the next um, few slides that focus on key topics around data integration, such as stakeholder engagement, data privacy and consent, and governance. And these resources are designed to support states in wherever they're at in the data integration process. So for those of you that may be just starting out, as well as those of you who have been working on this and are tackling specific issues. So as you'll see in the resources, we were informed by the work being done in our five SHINE states, and we're able to draw upon the successes and challenges as helpful examples. I want to give you a few examples of some state successes on the next slide. All of our states were successful in advancing their work to integrate home visiting data with other early childhood data. So I just want to highlight a few. Um, the states were brought together key stakeholders to inform the process of integrating data. So many times, agencies that were not typically working together started to collaborate through this process. 
states established data sharing agreements to integrate home visiting data and started the process of integrating that data with other early childhood data. We also saw states that incorporated home visiting into either existing data governance structures or they identified a new data governance structure to oversee this integration with home visiting data. And states also began the alignment of data elements across them, those home visiting models to kind of see where the data elements um, were similar or different across the program. So we're going to um, talk about some of the resources next, but I want to pause and see if there are any clarifying questions before we continue. There are no current questions, but I do want to encourage folks to please, um, if you have any questions as the presentation goes forward, you don't have to save them till the end. You can um, submit them throughout the presentation and we'll try to address any clarifying questions in between presenters and save larger questions for our discussion uh, part at the end of the webinar. Great, thanks Carly. So I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague now, Van Kim Lim, to tell you about some of our resources. Thanks, Dale. So like Dale mentioned, we developed a suite of nine resources throughout this project in order to support data integration leaders and states to integrate their home visiting data with other early childhood data. So these resources are meant to either be used individually if you're interested in a particular topic that we discussed today, or they can be used together because we know that a lot of times these activities may build off of one another. We also aim to keep these resources short, Brief using plain language and incorporating as many examples or samples as we could to make it as user friendly and practical for you. So as we move on to the next slide, I also want to note that you can find these resources on our website. It's childtrends.org backslash shine hyphen initiative. So we'll send out that information um, after the webinar, but you can start to access these already online. So on the next slide, one of the initial steps in the process of integrating home visiting data with other early childhood data is to really have a strong understanding of the types of policy questions you may want to answer by integrating your data. Having strong and clear policy questions can help ground the integration process as well as act as a decision making framework as you move on with the process. So for instance, you may not need to integrate all of the data from one data source with all of the data from another if you're facing financial or logistical limitations. Rather, using your strong policy questions that you develop, you can focus your integration on the few but necessary data elements to help answer those questions. So many of you on the line may already have a list of questions that you're hoping to answer, but others of you may not be sure what types of questions or information you can learn when your data are integrated. So in the developing policy questions to guide integration of home visiting with other early childhood data resource, we offer suggestions for these policy questions that could be answered when data are integrated either across home visiting models and programs, when home visiting data are integrated with other early childhood programs, such as within child welfare or maybe the health system, or if you're interested in examining questions about home visiting and early childhood over time, so longitudinally. This resource may help you and your team to develop more tailored policy questions if you already have them um, that can help best support early childhood programs in your state, again, either prior to the integration process or as you continue on in that process. On the next slide, we also highlight another activity that we recommend considering at the start of the integration process. And this is how you engage stakeholders throughout the integration process. We suggest using an approach that really engages a diverse group of stakeholders at every step of the way to ensure that data integration benefits everyone at all levels, especially families and children who can benefit the most from home visiting services and the questions we can answer with these integrated data. The Engaging Stakeholders in Home Visiting Data Integration Efforts resource outlines some of those steps that your team can make. So being able to identify those stakeholders, determining the right type of information you either wanna share with them or that you wanna gather from them since we really see stakeholder engagement as a two-way activity and then how to choose when and how you engage those stakeholders throughout the process. 
On the next slide, I'm, we're going to share with you an image that's included in this particular resource, um, which shows four different ways that you might be able to engage stakeholders. So the first level on the bottom, informing, is letting people know that data integration is happening. This is merely just to inform that this is a, a thing happening in your state. And you'll notice that it has the widest bar because we suggest and recommend that you cast a wide net when informing stakeholders about this process. The next step is collaborating with a subset of these stakeholders, being able to gather information from them, get um, being able to share a little bit more, or having them inform key aspects of the integration and help make some of those decisions. And then as you move up, another smaller subset of those, you might want to consult. And these are people who have some sort of expertise in different aspects. So for example, you may want to bring together a group of people who have expertise in data systems when you're starting to think about what types of data system can you build or do you need in order to integrate those data. Or you may want to bring together a small group of home visiting leaders from key models or in key leadership positions to help inform whether or not the reports that are going to be available once you integrate these data are going to benefit home visitors and the families that they're serving. Finally, the last activity that you could do is share the leadership of the integration process. Um, we strongly encourage being able to have a diverse set of perspectives at the leadership level when making the final decisions about data integration. And these are the individuals who will ultimately be responsible for ensuring that home visiting data are integrated. On the next slide. So once you have developed your strong questions that have been informed by a variety of stakeholders, you may want to start digging deep into identifying or inventorying the types of home visiting data that are available in your state. So the identifying home visiting data to integrate with other early childhood data resource includes a process for being able to understand the types of data sources that you'll need to answer your questions. Um, it also helps you to identify the available data and any existing linkages, um, as well as providing tips for how to create a visual of these data sources to help guide the process, which can act as a communication tool if you want to be sharing about this work to people who are not familiar with data integration. So on the next slide, we show an example of what this type of inventory can look like um, that is included in this resource. Um, this isn't available right now, but we are also working on having a blank template of this inventory that you can download and take to a meeting in order to do this type of inventory work. But as you can see, what we lay out are some aspects of understanding different data sources to see if it is feasible for you to actually integrate those data. So you want to know either the pro program or model name, as well as how that data is being stored, either in paper or electronic form, knowing that it's easier to connect data in an electronic form. The types of data that are being collected to know whether you can link data from one source to another, either at the child, family, or program level, where those data are actually housed, who owns it, who manages it, since we know there's lots of negotiations around sharing those data. And then if you have any contact information of those people. And then finally, if there are any existing linkages, we know that data that have been linked previously are maybe easier to link moving forward. So being able to have an understanding of what current linkages exist or don't may help you make decisions about the feasibility of data integration. And then finally, on this next slide, we want to show you and highlight an example from one of our shine states, Oklahoma, um, that shows how you can visually represent some of this information. So this particular image shows the different programs that are connected to one another that may be of interest to either your team or the state, um, and shows the different linkages that already exist and linkages that are desired but don't currently exist. Having that information allows stakeholders, policymakers, administrators, or your team understand either what has been done, what upcoming activities are prioritized or planned, and what may still be left to do. 
Um, so I'll pause now just to see if there are any initial clarifying questions on these first three resources. Thank you. We have received several questions and some of them we will hold <laughs> till the end of the call because um, I think it'll be great for our audience to hear from our state examples. I think one that might be helpful to clarify, if you can highlight what were some of the largest challenges that states faced around stakeholder engagement. Sure. I think one of sure. one of the, the biggest um, challenges that we hear from at least state leaders is they know which groups of stakeholders they want to engage but being able to actually get those groups to participate or know the best way to reach them is often a challenge so for example home visitors we already know have a heavy load and they're a key stakeholder group that can really either benefit from data integration and or be a strong voice about how data integration can benefit um, the the field at large but with their load, it just is really hard to get them to be engaged. And so we recommend meeting them where they are, figuring out what is the best way they've already been um, engaged previously, how they prefer to be engaged, and working with them so that you can engage the right audience and making sure you have that uh, diverse and comprehensive perspective when you're moving to moving forward with integration. So, of course, we um, once we open it up for our shine states, I'd love to get them to share their perspective, but that is one of the key challenges that we have heard about and seen and we, we hope to address within that resource. And Van Kim, just one other quick clarifying question, I think this quick answer, does this work require that unique child identifiers currently exist? Sure, I think there's lots of different ways that you can work with that. If you have a unique identifier for a child, that is wonderful. I also know that that can often be um, rare within data systems and also a lot of work to get up to speed. So of course, if you have a unique identifier, that's always a great way to go. But there are different strategies for being able to match children or families or programs across data sources, which could include things like getting a few different pieces of identifying information that you can try to triangulate across data sources. Um, and so I think, um, Again, I'd love to hear what other states have done um, because some of our states have a unique identifier and some of them don't, and they've been able to make um, some of those connections. But it's not necessary. It's great if you have it. And if you can move towards that, we, we definitely encourage it, but um, it's, it's definitely not necessary. Great, okay, thank you. Please keep sending those questions um, and we will, as i responding to them, we will save those for the end. Next slide. Sure. Well, I'll, I'll pass it to you, Carly. I think you're up next. Yes. <clears throat> So I'm going to share several of our resources that we've developed on data governance, um, data privacy and security, um, as well as strategies for funding all of this wonderful work. Uh, but so first, just to to effectively integrate home visiting data requires that you have a strong data governance structure. Uh, and this resource, um, we talk about steps for including uh, home visiting representation in your data governance structure. And if you don't have one, what steps that you can take. Uh, so just first, data governance bodies are responsible for overseeing the maintenance, the integration, the appropriate use, as well as the confidentiality and security of data that's integrated across agencies. So this resource provides recommendations to make sure that you have representation on your data governance structure from someone in home visiting that can help inform and make decisions um, relating to those data. So first, you want to determine whether the state has an existing data governance structure that oversees and integrates early childhood. If they don't, then you want to make sure that you have home visiting representation presented represented during the planning process. If you, your state does have an existing data governance structure, you want to understand the current rules and requirements for membership um, and thinking about how to make sure that early home visiting data are represented. So generally for a lot of data governance structure, 
those that are contributing data to the system are represented in that body in terms of decision making or providing input on how data are aligned and used and informing the process. So in thinking about who from home visiting would be represented in your data governance structure, the resource talks about how you should consult home visiting groups um, about how you would want to be, how they would want to be represented. And part of this is determining whether there may be already existing committees or leadership within your state that are already working on coordinating um, home visiting data statewide. And then the third recommendation is to then identify the level of decision making for, for your home visiting representative. So as I mentioned before, typically an agency or a program contributing data are represented in, in the governance structure. And on the next slide, I'll show an example from Utah's data governance structure. So in Utah, there are Early Childhood Integrated Data Systems Policy Committee oversees the implementation of their state level early childhood integrated data system. And you'll see here in this graphic that members consist of programs contributing data to their ESIDs. Um, and each member has a, they have a voting structure in place that allows them to select a chair and each program um, votes on decisions in terms of how they're going to be linking and developing their system. And they have a process in place so as the, as the program grows or have as the number of programs that are contributing to their state data system grows, they may change this structure. But the important thing about the data governance structure is that one, you have representation that can really help inform the process, and two, you have a process that allows you to make decisions um, on how the system is going to move forward. Next slide. Governance structures also play a key part in thinking through privacy and security considerations when integrating home visiting data. The next two resources that I'm going to review focus on thinking about these privacy and security considerations as well as processes for obtaining consent um, when beginning to integrate home visiting data. The first resource walks through different types of entities, laws, regulations that you want to make sure that you consult before integrating your home visiting data. The purpose is to have a clear understanding of the current rules that govern home visiting data in your state, and this may include federal laws and regulations such as HIPAA and FERPA, which are are referenced a lot, but you also want to be thinking about state agency laws and regulations that may have specific guidelines around data sharing. Uh, if you have a data governance structure that has already laid out some specific rules and regulations around data sharing, but also that home visiting data is housed a lot at the local level. So if there's individual local programs or implementing agencies that have specific rules and regulations around data sharing, that you're also consulting those. And then also for states that are using specific data systems or home visiting model or working with home visiting model developers and vendors, there may be in your contracts rules and regulations about how that information can be accessed and shared. So the resource really walks through these different examples so that you're clearly informed before moving forward with the integration process. Next step, next slide. Another important component of privacy is obtaining consent. Uh, this resource focuses on obtaining consent from families if you plan to integrate their data with other data systems. And this resource walks through four kind of key steps um, for users. One, first to determine if consent is required for the program and the data <clears throat> that you are wanting to integrate based on that you've gone through all of the considerations that I've listed on the previous slide. Uh, second, what will be your process for consent? So thinking about specifically who can provide consent and how that consent will be provided. For example, will families need to opt out or opt into their data being integrated? Many home visiting programs have existing consent forms that they're already using that will need to be reviewed and revised and updated to reflect any new uses of these data, such as integrating your home visiting data and sharing that with other authorized agencies. 
And then lastly, it's really important that any changes um, to these forms are communicated clearly and consistently to all stakeholders, including families. Next slide. Another key piece that your governance structure can support with is thinking about how to finance and finance the sustainability and ongoing costs associated with um, integrating your home visiting data and early childhood data. This resource focuses on strategies that states have used to fund activities related to the development, the implementation, and then the use of early childhood data. I think one of our biggest takeaways from our conversations with states on this topic is that there's rarely one source of data that supports this work. So you'll wanna consider different funding strategies based on where you are in the planning process and if the cost associated costs associated with data integration are one-time costs, such as developing your system's goals or a planning document, or if it's something that involves ongoing costs, such as staffing to support the analysis and use of data. So this resource recommends how to fund strategies really based on different activities and those costs that are associated. So again, thinking about planning costs, which may be one time, leveraging existing data infrastructures such as uh, a lot of states have state longitudinal data systems or existing human services data warehouses so thinking about how you can leverage technology cost the third is making sure that you have adequate funding for staffing uh, states that we've seen really successful in data integration typically have staff a staff person designated to lead this work um, and then last just identifying funding to support the analysis and use of data to inform decision making over time and that sometimes we see states are very focused on the integration and technical pieces and then don't have the staff at staffing capacity to really translate the, all of the data that they ultimately end up connecting on the next slide we have a list of examples um, of funding to support early childhood data integration so we share several examples in the resources of funding that can be used for one time or ongoing costs for data integration, for maintenance, and then for analysis or reporting of early childhood data. As I mentioned before, there are rarely grants specifically to integrate early childhood data and home visiting data. However, there are allowable uses to fund and support ongoing reporting of data and use of data to improve program outcomes. And so <clears throat> what you'll see in this resource is our examples of the different types of funding that states have used. This is just a sample of the list that are included in the resource. And then we talk about examples of how these funding sources have or could be used to inform planning or data systems development or, or staffing related to early childhood data systems. On the next slide, we have an example from Pennsylvania. Uh, and Pennsylvania's enterprise to link early childhood, to link children across networks, or Pelican as, it's, as the acronym is called, is funded with a combination of state and federal funds. So funding for staffing and administration comes from state agencies, such as the Department of Health and the Department of Human Services and the Department of Education. And they also leverage federal block grants such as the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families block grant, the Child Care Development block grant and Medicaid block grant to support this larger integrated early childhood data system that they have. Pennsylvania staff for their system they staff their system through subcontractors as well as agency staff. So this is just an example um, from a state where they've leveraged multiple data sources, funding sources to support the data analysis work that they have that they're doing. So I will hand the presentation back to Dale to discuss our last two resources before we move on. And then we'll move to the broader Q&A. Great, thanks so much, Carly. So on the next slide, I'm gonna talk about the last two resources that we've developed through SHINE. 
We know that especially with home visiting data, that um, these data can be stored in many different places depending on what options are available either at the state or local level, or if there are requirements about how data are collected and stored through the home visiting national models themselves. So we've developed a resource on how to navigate between multiple systems that may house home visiting data. This resource discusses common ways that home visiting data are stored at both the state and local levels. So such as proprietary data systems, homegrown data systems that maybe the states develop, or even data that are stored on a computer in say an Excel document. We know there's a whole range of how these data can be stored um, and how they're collected. So the resource describes those different ways that they're stored and then also provides recommendations for how states can navigate between these different systems and things to consider when working to integrate data that are stored in these different places. And then on the next slide, our last resource, which is certainly not the, the last in the order, you can use these resources in any way that you want to use them and depending on where you're at. But we know that through this process of integrating home visiting data that it definitely takes time and it doesn't need to happen all at once. So this, there are many ways in which a state could start this process and we saw that in each one of our shine states choosing to take a different incremental approach. This resource outlines ways to begin the process using that incremental approach and highlights some state examples for what this could look like. So for instance, states could choose to first integrate data within certain geographic regions, like specific counties. We saw that in Minnesota, who chose their largest county to start integrating home visiting data with their early childhood longitudinal data system. Or they could begin with select funding sources. So just using certain funding streams and choosing those models to begin with, or selecting certain home visiting models that may be based in certain locations or, um, have larger representation in the states before then broadening out to be to integrate other home visiting models. Another option that we saw is that states could also choose to integrate home visiting data with select early childhood programs, especially if they don't already have an integrated, an early childhood integrated data system in place. So they may choose to just select with one or two other early childhood programs to begin with to start that integration process. And then lastly, another way that we've seen states um, begin to integrate home visiting data is to choose which data to integrate based on specific research or policy questions, focusing on getting answers to specific questions and then determining what data from which specific programs are needed to have that linkages. So there are many ways to go about doing this, but um, if you are working in a state to begin this process and it seems that there's a lot of different ways and overwhelming. These are certainly ways that we've seen our shine states tackle it and they all went about it in a slightly different way um, to begin integrating their home visiting data. So on the next slide, I'll give you an example from Rhode Island. So Rhode Island opted to start by integrating home visiting data with child welfare data. And this approach aligned with the state's need to answer specific questions requiring the integration of these two programs data. So for example, the state was interested in understanding whether children enrolled in home visiting programs were less likely to be part of the child welfare system. And Rhode Island used this approach to pilot the data integration with home visiting and child welfare data to demonstrate the types of questions that could not otherwise be answered if the data systems were not integrated. So this is an example of an incremental approach to starting that pilot um, looking at data from child welfare and home visiting models that were in the Department of Health and being able to start linking those data together. So those are all of the resources that we have developed. I think we're gonna switch now. I'm gonna turn it back to Carly to um, open it up for questions. Yes, and I'm pleased to see how many questions that we've received. Uh, next slide. So I am going to, first of all, I want to welcome our representatives that we have from Utah as well as Minnesota and Rhode Island on the line that are participating. So I'm going to try a lot of these questions I think are really helpful to hear from our state representatives and Oklahoma <laughs> that have all joined us for our Q&A portion um, to share a lot of the wonderful work that they've been doing. <clears throat> so I think 
first, I think we'll start with um, some of the questions that we received in terms of Van Kim's first um, section around stakeholder engagements um, and developing data sharing agreements. So I will direct this first question toward our folks in Minnesota, and I know that you guys are there. Can you talk a little bit more about your experience um, engaging other stakeholders and also um, <clears throat> the need to set up data sharing agreements as part of your process? Hi, this is Marcia Milker. I'm with Kathy Silver here, and we are with St. Paul Ramsey County Public Health, which is um, actually Ramsey County is not the largest county in the state. I just want to just say that but we are the second largest, and I do believe that one of the um, um, components that facilitated our process was that we do all of our home visiting in house. And so, for example, Kathy Silver, Silver oversees, you know, um, like. There's many models, and so that, that mix of support, and so back to your question, um, I would just say that our stakeholders were mostly internal. We did not have to work with, um, not have to, we didn't have the pleasure of working with other entities because we managed all of the counties, the large county companies. Okay. We did work with the Minnesota Department of Health on this effort, um, which was very successful, and um, we learned a lot through that. Great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> the second question is for Stephen Matherly, who's joining us from Utah um, from their Early Childhood Integrated Data System. How did you deal with data privacy and confidentiality issues when integrating different data sources? Oh, right, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, with regards to integrating different data sources, uh, here in Utah, uh, where we have our early childhood integrated data system, we call eKids, it's located at the Department of Health. So within the Department of Health, we have various data sources, and then we have external uh, programs participating as well. But whether it's external or internal, we really had to research uh, the funding source and do a deep dive as to the specific um, rules or, or regulations that uh, pertain to that uh, very specific uh, data source. So with regards to home visiting, uh, we have our McVee uh, funded uh, program here at the Department of Health and we worked with the federal, you know, we worked with the, um, uh, McVee themselves at the federal office, that was Dr. Willis, you know, at the time. And internally we worked with our uh, privacy, security, and legal. And uh, while we've always had a release, in place with our LIA local implementing agencies. That release really covered uh, just sharing uh, data with the lead agency, Department of Health, for programmatic and administrative and reporting purposes. So a few years ago, we adapted that release to speak uh, to our uh, desire to integrate data and really use uh, integrated data to evaluate uh, the success of, of programs. <clears throat> Thank you, Stephen. Sorry, I'm switching people on and off <laughs> um, as I'm muting myself. So I guess the next question that we had, I'm gonna direct actually back to Dale. Um, could you say a little bit more, someone had a question about, does other early childhood data include schools? Could you talk a little bit about the scope of integrating early childhood with other, <clears throat> other early childhood data and how school data plays into that spectrum? Sure. Um, so when we think about early childhood data, we think about early childhood data broadly, and um, that's one of the things that it's not just education, it's not just preschool or um, subsidized childcare assistance, but it's thinking about all of the different programs, um, health, education, social services, and some states see early childhood education going through up to age eight. Some may see it through preschool, but regardless, when we think about linking those data, 
we do want to think about linking all the way through getting into kindergarten through 12th grade, um, kind of going through the school data. We've seen some states that when they're linking their early childhood data, that um, especially the kindergarten through third grade period is included. Some states go all the way through. Um, other states have different systems, but they're finding a way to link. But we know the importance of not just understanding what's happening in early childhood, but also what's happening longitudinally and being able to connect to school um, data, education data in the K-12 realm to really see those both short-term and long-term outcomes. So we do think about early childhood more broadly and then um, moving up through the school system. Great, thank you. Uh, so, and then this question is for Deb Anderson, who's joining us from Oklahoma. And this also relates to how you handled the stakeholder process. And the question was, how did you see the power dynamics in your particular projects working out? Did it affect the project at all? And a little bit about um, how you work with stakeholders to talk about uh, decision-making. Deb, I believe you're muted on your own. If you can unmute yourself, we can hear you better. This is Van Kim. I can share a little bit on behalf of Oklahoma. Um, I know that in Oklahoma, they held a series of stakeholder uh, meetings. Uh, one of them was focused primarily on inviting home visitors uh, to talk about this process that they were hoping to do to showcase some of the questions that they were interested in answering and seeing if uh, those questions would also benefit home visitors at the program level. And they continue to do that through their preschool development grant funding, um, engaging a wide range of stakeholders throughout that process as well. They also started to be able to engage a lot of their leadership. Um, their, um, with changes in leadership, um, as many of you may know, um, it's bringing new leadership up to speed and they were able to use uh, and leverage some of the work that they had already done on this project and with the preschool development grant in order to get some of these key leaders on board and supportive of the data integration process such that they're starting to have these conversations with a large amount of support across a lot of different agencies. Um, and they also have a unique system where they have a specific type of data sharing agreement that works across a lot of their programs and agencies so that they can easily share data. And we know that this has helped them navigate the rules related to HIPAA and FERPA specifically within their state. Um, and so uh, we really see that Oklahoma has done great work in both engaging stakeholders, but also being able to work across um, leadership to, to get some of these pieces together. So um, if we're, we're happy to connect um, you with Deb in Oklahoma moving forward, if you have any further questions. Great, thank you. We have some more uh, questions coming through. Um, <clears throat> and this goes, this will go back to Minnesota folks. Uh, someone was asking, maybe one of the Shine States can talk about how they started their process and what were a few of the first steps to get it going. And then Minnesota, we also had a question about if states use their race to the top to support some of this work. So I'm wondering if you could also talk a little bit about that as well. And then also, could you um, speak up a little bit? I think when you responded to your last question, your voice was a little muffled if you guys are using a speakerphone. I don't know if Ken's on the phone from MDE, but this is Kathy Silver from St. Paul Ramsey. Um, I think I wasn't here at the time um, when this grant started, but I know that we were approached by um, MDH, Minnesota Department of Health, um, Ginny at the Department of Health about this grant. Um, 
and that's how we kind of got into it. Um, we were asked to write a, a part of our proposal, and we submitted that, and we thought it was a great opportunity for us to start this process in Minnesota, um, especially with um, the work that's being done at the legislature here about um, connecting our systems, and that's been a big push in Minnesota. Uh, to try to get us all to connect our systems and um, helping our families, uh, improve our families and helping them get to where they need to be with these systems instead of having such a siloed, um, just having such siloed systems that keep us from working together and getting the best outcomes for our families. Hi, Kathy. So this it is really Jen. was when I said it was easy earlier. Sorry, this is Marcia. I have to I have to go back and give the credit to, um, to the Department of Education. And I didn't hear Jen on the line, but she'll speak to yeah. the grants. They were already up and running years before. So yeah. I think she's on the yeah. Yep, yep. So this is Jen Verbrugge with the Minnesota Department of Education, and I actually came on this project about um, a year and a half ago. So I was not here either when this first started, but as I understand it, um, we identified Ramsey, St. Paul Ramsey County Public Health as a partner because they um, were in a good position to, um, they had a really excellent data collection system that would align pretty easily with our ESIDs. So um, we thought that they would be a good place to start as a pilot. Um, partner for this sort of work. Um, and I don't believe we used any Race to the Top funds for this in particular. Um, Race to the Top was used to help build our ESIDs in the first place so that we had that in place and launched that in February of 2016. But the, the home visiting data work that we've been doing um, was subsequent to that. Great, thank you. And then I have a question. I will move up to Dale quickly. There was a question about how can academic researchers join this current effort or initiate amazing work with other states that haven't done this yet? That is a great question. And um, I would say that um, it's really important for states and academic researchers to work together on this. And academic researchers can be an incredibly valuable resource throughout this process of understanding how to integrate data and that process, but having the states work together. So it can be a wonderful partnership. We've definitely seen that in some states where states are looking for someone that may be an external state partner that they can collaborate with to help them figure out what are the next steps? How do you integrate data? What are some research questions? What are some policy questions to answer? Um, thinking about helping the states determine what are their goals, um, what is the process that they want to take. We've seen some states that use academic institutions to actually house their data or to do the linkage process. So the linking that Van Kim had mentioned, sometimes we see states with unique identifiers that they're using a particular software, but sometimes they're using a matching process and that can happen in many different places and sometimes that does happen within a university setting. So um, we'd encourage researchers to be reaching out to their states to see how they can help and for states to look to researchers as other supports that they may be able to help with this process um, thinking it through. So they're a great resource. Great, thank you. And then we had a couple of questions that wanted to understand, to talk a little bit more about the state's experience translating the data into information and action. And there was a specific question, and I'm not sure if any of the states um, have this experience, um, and we'll start, Steve, with you guys, about if anyone has um, used prenatal screening data, um, examining substance abuse, um, being used to identify highly vulnerable children who need access to high quality early care. So, <clears throat> Generally, how have you used the data for access, for action? And then if anyone has specific examples related to prenatal screening. Steven, we'll start with you. Yeah, that's a great question and a great aspiration over time. Right now we're building what we call an early childhood Utah community assessment tool. And once again, I mentioned we're at the Department of Health. So we have access uh, to the birth records. So we're taking, you know, uh, aggregated, you know, data. It's not unit level like our e-kids, and we're we're making that, uh, you know, 
mother's uh, age and education level, low birth weights, preterm birth, if the mom had uh, prenatal care, and dozens of other types of kind of demographic data uh, to be able to assess uh, communities throughout the state. Now then, <clears throat> over time, as our eKids advances, and with our unique position at the Department of Health, uh, it, it would be wonderful if we can operation, right? Our eKids is built on the foundation of, you know, research and connecting to the state's SLDS. How many kids are we serving? Who are we, who are we missing? Where do they live? And then as we connect to the SLDS, how do the children that we serve do on kindergarten entry, K through three and beyond? But <clears throat> it's a wonderful question. We've had conversations about it. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could go ahead and integrate uh, some of that birth record data with regards to preterm births or low weight births, things of that nature, and go ahead and utilize that data <clears throat> to um, outreach to the family and connect them uh, to services, you know, right, to, right out of the gate, if you will, you know, right out of the hospital. Uh, so we haven't gotten to that uh, level of, of sophistication yet. Um, we, we do have a birth uh, defects uh, program, and they have some integrated data as well, and they work closely with early intervention. So it, it's happening on a level, but we can definitely take it, uh, take it higher. Thank you. I don't know if we were able to get Deb Anderson from Oklahoma back on audio. If Deb wanted to add or make any comments, were we able to get her on? I don't think so, but they, one of the, the pieces that they were able to integrate in the beginning was their early intervention. So that's a little bit different than prenatal screening, but being able to get some of that early information and connect with home visiting in order to be able to coordinate services for their, their home visiting families was one of their um, focuses with this project. Great. And then I will do one last question. Thank you all everyone, for these wonderful questions. Um, <clears throat> and I'll bring this one back to Minnesota and maybe Jennifer, this might be a question for you. Are there already many existing information systems, structures, and did you create a new platform or did you build upon the largest one, more well-established data system? across all existing data sets. So essentially, did you leverage other data systems in your work in Minnesota to develop your um, early child longitudinal data system? And if so, how? That's a great question. So um, what we have done is uh, we have created our central ESIDs that pulls in data from a number of different data sources. So, um, and we receive that data in a, a number of different ways. So sometimes it's submitted through, um, like in a spreadsheet or something, through a secure um, portal into our system. And then our um, IT team will work on that. Other um, data sources will submit directly. Um, it just depends on which agency is the owner and how we um, are connected to those different data systems. So we built our ESIDs. Um, from scratch, but it was inspired um, by the work that was done to build our um, SLEDS, our SLEDS, um, which is more for high school through college through workforce. So that was built first and we used lessons learned and a lot of knowledge gained from that to build our ESIDs. And I will say um, to, I, I wanted to mention that we don't yet have our home visiting data available through the public reports on our ESIDs, um, but we are working on those reports right now. And we are first looking at how it connects with early childhood screening. And um, I think the question that we're wondering is if um, the, the referrals that home visitors are making to the families to have their children screened, if those are actually being followed through on. So that is our first question that we're trying to answer with this data. So we're gonna start slowly and then build from there. Thank you, Jennifer. So I just wanna um, hand things over to Dale to close out, but we will make sure to follow up with anybody with some with any pending questions, but we were able to get through a lot of them. Thank you guys for all these wonderful, great questions. And I think one of them was just asking about examples of existing early childhood integrated data systems. So I think we can share some link to some state um, examples and links to websites for our our shine, our shine states too, so that you can learn more about their systems and the work that they've done. Dale? Great, 
Thank you. So if you can go to the next slide in terms of what's next. We hope that these resources are useful to you in your work to integrate home visiting data with other early childhood data. And we are very excited to launch these resources, which are all now available on the Child Trends website um, under Early Childhood Data Collaborative section. We're continuing to work in this space through various other projects, helping states and make the awardees and their state data partners with integrating home visiting data and other early childhood data, thinking about the home visiting landscape in general and creating additional resources. So we hope that you'll stay in touch. Let us know how you've used these resources, how they're helpful to your work, reach out with any additional questions and tell us about all of the great work you're doing to integrate data to better support children and families. And if you go to the next slide, just want to thank all of you for participating in this webinar. Thank all of our Shine States who are on the call today um, and for all of their work. They've been incredible in moving this forward and um, leading the way for home visiting data integration with other early childhood data. So thank you all for attending. Thank you.